There are many powerful mages in the history and lore of Dungeons & Dragons. Spells, books, and tomes are named after only the most powerful of mages and wizards. Only one mage has such an impact, where you know the name, the spells, and all the legacy through books written and retold. Mordekainen, a powerful archmage whose namesakes are known across his universe and ours. Mordekainen's Tome of Foes, Mordekainen presents monsters of the multiverse, and even spells such as Mordekainen's Faithful Hound, Magnificent Mansion, and Mordekainen's Sword. Well, you probably don't know anything about him, and Mordekainen is an archmage human male, a hawk-like face with a permanent frown that gives the appearance of alertness and almost anger. He is typically stubborn and does not suffer fools gladly. Mordekainen can even be difficult with his friends, of which he has very few. Despite all this, Mordekainen has a legendary and multiverse transcending journey since he was first introduced, and his story is still being written. It is not known where Mordekainen came from. The first we see of him, he is already presumably hundreds of years old and accomplished. We see him residing on Earth in the Greyhawk setting. Not that Earth, but Earth from the Greyhawk setting. It's totally different and unique from our Earth and our galaxy, if you know anything about the Greyhawk system. During his travels, Mordekainen became concerned with the tentative peace that hovered above the continent of Eric, a continent of Earth. In his eyes, the scales of celestial power were in a constant state of unbalance, and he feared what would occur should there not be a line of defense to keep the peace. Seeking no better option, he put it upon himself and his apprentice, Bigby, to seek out others to join them on their quest to protect Flanais. And so Mordekainen created the Circle of Eight. It is said that no living persons are more famous in the Flanus than Mordekainen and his Circle of Eight. These nine wizards serve as unofficial watchdogs on the continent, monitoring Eric for trouble. Because most members are neutral in alignment, the group is concerned with maintaining balance in the world and not allowing any faction to become too powerful or overwhelming. Though much of the time in D&D lore, evil forces are threatening to seize control of the land, so the Circle of Eight has worked on the side of good in order to contain these ever-growing evils. The Circle went through some difficult times splitting up and reforming, but Mordekainen stayed at the head throughout, bringing some of his most trusted advisors and other wizards of the land into the circle. They could easily best any evil or good to maintain a neutrality across the continent, until the return of Vecna. They heard rumors of a new power that sought to join Earth's vast pantheon of God, and its efforts threatened to corrupt the magical order of the known world. And upon investigating, the circle discovered artifacts known as the Hand and Eye of Vecna. Finding the tyrant alive, the ill-prepared Circle of Eight panicked. They were without Mordekainen and went up against Vecna, who destroyed the entire circle, save Mordekainen, who had elected to remain in Greyhawk as a safeguard. This left Mordekainen completely alone without his circle and up against the greatest challenge that he had ever faced. So the Archmage mobilized the circle's allies and a small group of apprentice wizards, former companions, and longtime friends to embark on a nearly hopeless journey to thwart Vecna. Somehow, some speculate the intervention of gods. The intrepid adventurers managed to banish the maimed god. And not only did Mordekainen save the day and thwart Vecna, but he also took time to collect what was left of all of his eight fallen comrades and managed to clone them, one of the greatest feats of magic known in the Greyhawk setting. Though this endeavor consumed a lot of time and left the continent and earth susceptible to attacks. Though after Mordekainen had revived the circle and helped them get things back on track, he thought it best to take a break and he began to travel not only in the Greyhawk setting, but between multiverses, having accomplished the greatest feats any mage could hope to accomplish confined to such a region. What actually might be most interesting about all of this is how we know all of this, because most things in D&D are speculation of people in the land, rumors, but these are definitive events that happened, and the source actually comes from Mordekainen himself, who, like I said, can travel across the multiverse. And it is actually canon D&D that Ed Greenwood, one of the creators of D&D and writers for Dragon Magazine, wrote into the canon that he 
Hid inside suits of armor in eavesdropped on Mordekainen and Elminster, one of Mordekainen's closest friends, and listened in on their conversations, hearing it straight from Mordekainen after all of these events occurred. Kind of a wild piece of actual D&D lore that is written into the world. So it is confirmed that Earth is part of at least the Greyhawk setting or across the multiverses. And Ed Greenwood has met Elminster and Mordekainen. But that is not where the story of Mordekainen ends. Mordekainen, of course, has a lot of adventures that we don't see about, whose impact might be known on the world. But an interesting glimpse we gain into Mordekainen is in a 5th edition book, The Curse of Strahd. In Curse of Strahd, we hear about a mad mage of Mount Beratok, and eventually we learn that this mad mage is in fact Mordekainen. Shortly after thwarting Vegna, Mordekainen traveled to one of the domains of dread in Ravenloft. He heard the tale of a vampire that was enslaving the country and sought to free the people. However, in Mordekainen's arrogance, he made one crucial mistake, underestimating Dark Lord Strahd, who was far more powerful than Mordekainen could have ever expected. And he fought tooth and nail, but was unable to gain the upper hand over the vampire. He was forced to retreat, losing his staff, spellbook, and eventually his mind. As the beaten wizard roamed Barovia, his once brilliant mind began to crack. His memories began to fade, and this left the wizard mad, and earning him the title of the Mad Mage of Mount Baratok. This is a low in Mordekainen's story, and since then, he struggles to regain what he had lost. At times, he is coherent and continues to pursue his studies, but he can never rid himself of the madness that befell him. Whether it is because of shame or paranoia, he has secluded himself in the Tower of Urm, which is a vehicle he uses to travel through the multiverse. And to this day, the wizard continues to travel the realms, studying the schools of magic, despite his intermittent madness. We do see Mordekainen in other places after this, such as Waterdeep and even the Nine Hells, but he still suffers from these bouts of madness, though despite his madness, he is still maintaining the balance of the multiverse and occasionally visits Avernus to study the effects of the Nine Hells and continues to keep all of the schools in magic at bay to ensure to balance the universe, though this madness has gotten better, sometimes it overtakes him. And if Mordekainen were ever truly overtaken by this madness, no one really knows what it could mean for the universe and all the multiverses across D&D. Most of these characters and legends, tales, even gods are contained within these settings, Greyhawk, Forgotten Realms, Planescape, but characters like Mordekainen transcend this. That is why we're able to have books and spells named after him that surpass these barriers of multiverse or universe. Any universe, any setting can cast Mordekainen's Magnificent Mansion, and here on Earth, which is canon in D&D, we are able to read his books, see his quotes, and see his guides breaking down the universe and the multiverses. And so he still does have this madness and continues to carry on the legacy of Mordekainen. And if he ever should fall, we can only hope that one of his circle or another very powerful archmage steps up to take the helm of this extremely important role of balance. Thank you everyone for watching this video. Please check out some other videos and other forgotten lores if you like the lore. I'm going to be planning on doing some of these more D&D legends where we look at characters that are known across different multiverses, spells named after, books named after, because a lot of people know these names, but we never know the person behind them. So let me know who you guys want to see next, and thank you so much for watching.